Today is a message that I'm gonna be talking about not for sale, not for sale, and it is a preventative maintenance message. Um, so so when, when you've got a car, you take it in for routine checkups, routine maintenance. You take it in for oil changes, right? College students, um, we take our cars in for oil changes and tire rotations. And um, when, you, when you keep your car and you plan on keeping it a while, there's belts that need to be checked. And I'm not going to go really into this because I'm about to get into too deep a water that I can't swim in talking about vehicle stuff. But I know this much that when I do preventative maintenance on my vehicles, it's supposed to keep major problems from happening. It's not that a major problem has occurred. It's that we are trying to keep major problems from occurring in the vehicle that I'm driving. That is the heart of this message today. Today is our one-year anniversary in this building, our one-year anniversary in this building. So we're super thankful Super thankful. And I don't think there's a better message I could preach to celebrate our one year anniversary in this building. And so some of us are gonna be like, well, what's really going on? Nothing else is really going on. But can I tell you, man, God is gonna continue to do amazing, incredible things in Foundation Church as long as we don't get in our own way, right? As long, some, some churches are their own worst enemy. And I can name you churches that were their own worst enemy that are no longer in, like they're no longer open. Their, their doors are closed. And and I thank God for what God is doing in and through Foundation Church and what's happening in this place. And I don't want us to take it for granted. So we're going to dive in and I'm going to invite you, man, yell with me, scream with me, clap with me, um, because we got a lot to celebrate today. And I love, love where we're going. So the first thing is this. First thing I want us to know is healthy things grow and change. Healthy things grow and and changed. Acts chapter 2, verse 46 through 47, it says this, they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people, and each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. We, we know this scripture, right? Awesome, awesome scripture. And every day, each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those, were who, those who were being saved. Something is happening right now in Acts chapter 2 that has never happened in the history of mankind. There is a movement that is happening. It was called the way before it was called Christianity. The birth of Christianity, the birth of following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is occurring. And as we're reading right here, the birth of the New Testament church is happening and is occurring. And there's all this excitement and there's this growth that's explosive and all this stuff's going on. And everybody's like, whoa, have you seen what is happening? Check this out. We, we know this, right? Things... People are being added, People, they're going by thousands and thousands. <clears throat> and then we hop down four chapters later, Acts chapter six, it says this, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. No, that doesn't happen in churches, shut your mouth. What? <clears throat> the Greek speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribu distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers, and they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Dang. Um, and so, brothers... Select seven men who are well-respected and full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility. So God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Here's, here's what I love. There was great growth happening in the New Testament church. People are being added. I mean, there are things happening that have never happened before. And yet four chapters after chapter two, this is no longer the church that was birthed, you know, on the day of Pentecost where the disciples were gathered in the upper room and some other believers and the Holy Ghost, you know, came down and they started speaking in tongues and the church caught like wildfire. That, that no, no. The church has grown to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It did not look like what it, it used to look like. It did not feel like what it felt like. It had changed and it had looked different because something great was happening. Hear me today. Healthy 
things grow and change. Healthy things grow and change. And the church was different and it looked different because it was different. Can I tell you, Foundation Church, I am so thankful that Foundation Church looks different than what it did 14 years ago. I am so thankful that growing and changing looks different and feels different when it comes to our own lives. Um, I've got some pictures up here that kind of show just a snapshot of my life. Six different ones. The middle kid's always weird. You go, baby Justin, things are going good, and then Napoleon Dynamite hits. Go back, I wish you could see the, the third picture. I had my jams on and my socks up to here with some Converse, but, and then I don't know what's happening in this bottom left. And then sultry, sexy Justin with his Putnam City North basketball warm up on, and then me and Fish in college. Some of you are like, you and Fish, we've known each other that long. Yeah, we've been, we were roommates in college for one year because I drove them crazy. So um, imagine that. Because he's like, I didn't know that was an option. Um, but. Hear me, can can you throw those pictures up one more time, real quick? Thank God we grow and we change. Thank God, this is like a fine wine, it just gets better, right? It's like that that things, like healthy things grow, and I'm glad I don't look like this anymore. I'm glad I don't, you are too. (laughs) And just like I grew and changed, I'm not who I used to be 14 years ago, thank God. Right, I'm not the same pastor I was 14 years ago. And hear me, Foundation Church, if the church is truly healthy, then it doesn't, Foundation Church is not the same church it was 14 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, pre-COVID, post-COVID, or even a year ago when we opened this building. It is different because growing, healthy things grow and change, right? And I wanna let you know, man, we are growing and we are changing and God is adding to this church on a weekly basis. Last week, my people to call from Connect Cards was this thick. What an awesome problem we've got going on. Awesome things that are happening. But hear me, in the process of that, it's going to look different. It's going to feel different. And that's a good thing. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10 says this. Don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. And listen to me. I'm going to sit here and talk for just a second. Listen to me. You have seen churches, and I have seen churches, and you've been a part of churches, and I've been a part of churches, that they got caught in the good old days. And their best days were their past days. And hear me, that's not our story. That's not who we are. That's not where we're going. That's not what we're about. Our best days are our head days, right? Our best days are in front of us. And let me flesh this out to you. If your marriage looks the same as it did five years ago, shame on you. Your marriage should be better than what it was five years ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, 25 years ago. You should be more in love with her. And husbands, your wife should know that you're more in love with her. Your wives, your husbands should know that you appreciate and adore him. There shouldn't be this neglect. There shouldn't be this resentment towards one another. Your good things, healthy things grow and change. Your family should look different and feel different. Oh, it's not the same stage. Don't long for the good old days. That's not a wise way to live. Be present where you are and keep changing as a parent. Keep changing as a child. Keep changing at your job place. Some of you, you've been at the same job in the same position for 15 years because you're doing the bare minimum instead of being faithful where God planted you. Man, shame on you and be faithful and be prepared and be fruitful where you are because growing and changing things are healthy things. Man, we got to know this. And so understand, as we continue to go, it's going to look different and it's going to feel different. And I am so thankful for that. So let me give you this. Let me give you this charge. I want to charge you as a pastor through all this growing and all this changing and it looking different and it being different, 
Be a part of it instead of tearing it apart. Be a part instead of tear apart. All of us are, are creatures of habit. And what I found, I used to think old people didn't like change. It's not. It's people right now that are in their 20s and 30s. You got old. You got an old soul, you bunch of 20 and 30-year-olds. I'm like, what happened to you? You're young. I'm like 40. I'm like, we're doing something different? Sweet. I feel attacked. Good. Um, I feel targeted. Good. And, and when change happens and we don't like change, here's what we do. We grumble. We mumble. We talk about it. We talk about others. Well, I don't like that they're coming now. Nobody asked you. <laughs> Last I checked, your name wasn't on the door of the church and neither was mine. It's, it doesn't matter who comes in. Like, hey, they're welcome to come and hear a message that will change their life, right? <laughs> That's the job of the church. And here's what happens, and if we're not careful, we start talking about people and we start talking about things in the church and it's called gossip, right? We want to call it something else, but no, it's called gossip. And, and hear me on this. Gossip has hurt more people and more people have been hurt by people in the church than anything that has happened outside the church. Some of us, we are paranoid about satanic churches coming and destroying the church, the atheist movement, the, Gram the Grammys, the Smurfs back in the day that were concerned about whoever's the president's going to destroy this nation in the church. Hear me, nobody and nothing has done more damage in the church and to the church than Christians, right? Than church people because we attack and we eat our own and we talk about one another and we kill one another and we crucify one another because we don't like one another sometimes and we run our mouth when we should shut it. So what, so what are we doing? And hear me, some of you are going, who's, who's been talking, Justin? <laughs> Listen, the reason I'm so passionate about this because is this. This isn't the type of church we are, right? And I'm thankful for that. I am so thankful for that. But if we're gonna keep becoming all that God wants us to become, we can't let part of this happen because a little, a little gossip spreads, man. And when we don't like people, we talk about them. When we don't like something, we talk about them. And here's just a tiny sample of what the Bible has to say. In Proverbs chapter 11, it says this. It's foolish to belittle one's neighbor. A sensible person keeps quiet. The gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Proverbs 16, a troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Let me say this. If your relationship started with gossip, I can guarantee you it's going to end with gossip as well. If your whole relationship is built on talking about others, they're coming for you some moment and some time. Proverbs 20, a gossip goes around telling secrets. So don't hang out with chatterers. Woo. Romans 1, 28 through 31. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that, they should, ne that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and there it is, gossip. Well, that's pretty extreme. That's the exact view God takes on it. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. Well, Justin, some of you are going, you know the Bible. Well, Romans 1 is talking about enemies of God and those that are sinners. And in this passage of Scripture, it's talking about attributes of sinners. And one of those attributes is gossip. Sounds extreme. It is extreme because that's the kind of view God takes on it. And nowhere in the Bible does it ever say gossip is a good thing, that it's an okay thing, or if it's even a great thing. Mm -mm. In fact, James said it this way, James 1. It says, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're, a, you're fooling yourself. And your religion is worthless. Dang James. I'm going to do a series called Dang James. <laughs> right? If you claim to be religious, oh, I'm a follower of Christ. 
but you can't control your tongue, you're a fool, is what James is saying. I'm not saying it. Some of you are like, this is what the Bible says. Everybody knows you aren't living what you're proclaiming. And if you don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. But here's what I have found. Here's what I found. Here's what I found. I could preach this all day. The ones of us that have gone to the church the longest, we know how to dress it up so it doesn't seem like sin. Right? We know how to call it something so people aren't like, oh, well, they're gossiping. No, they're gossiping. We, we know how to dress the pig up so it doesn't look like a pig. Right? We say things like, well, I'm really concerned. I'm, I'm concerned about the direction and I'm concerned about the way they're heading. No, you're not. You just wanted to talk about them. Well, we really need to pray for that person because, oh, you don't know. Well, here's what you need to pray for. Right? And, and we know how to dress it up when you know what you're doing. Right? You know what you're doing is wrong. This isn't something that I have to be like, oh, yeah, yeah like that we have to be talked to. You know what you're doing is wrong. And here's what I would tell you. Gossip's never solved a thing, but it always destroys everything. Gossip has never sought, brought solution. It's never brought resolution. It's never brought reconciliation. But it destroys and poisons everything it touches. And man, I love that we are a church where we are not tearing people apart, but we are pointing imperfect people to a perfect Savior that can change your life. So if somebody comes in that you don't like, that you knew, and they aren't living the life that they should be, thank God that they're here. Thank God they're a place where their life can change, right? If there's something that is new that's happening at church and you don't like it, thank God we got a longer line to pick up kids at FC Kids because that means a lot more families are coming. Thank God there's different movement and different things that are happening. But, 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 no, it doesn't matter. Here's the solution. How do you solve gossip within a church? Proverbs 21, 23, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut. And you will stay out of trouble. Husbands, read that really carefully. <laughs> Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut. Just walk away. And you will stay out of trouble. So let me, let me give us this charge. Right, this preventive maintenance. Man, great things are happening. Be a part and stay together. Right, let's be a part of the solution and of what God is doing in this place. Let's get involved. Let's not just be spectators, but let's be participators. Let's be a part of what God is doing, and let's say together, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 1, says this, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no division in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Can I tell you one of the biggest challenges for me as a church and me as the pastor of this church is to keep all thousand plus, how awesome is that now, right? All thousand plus of us as a church moving in the same direction after the same vision, after the same purpose that God is calling us to. It's not to run after the vision Justin has. It's not, my job is not to build the church Justin likes or Justin wants. My job is to hear from the Lord, talk to our leadership team and lead us that way, right? And this is what the Bible is saying, Ephesians 4. Therefore, I a prison, I a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's fault because of your love. That means people are going to, Paul knew people were going to make you mad. Make allowance for it. Paul knew people were going to get on your nerves. Make allowance for it. If you get mad at somebody at church, don't just leave and don't just talk about it. Grow up and work it out, right? Make allowance for each other's fault because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Romans 14, 19. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Hear me. There's nothing Satan would want more. And to sow division, man, gossip, envy, 
in the body of Christ, and he's done it for way too long at too many churches, and that's not going to be our story, Foundation Church, right? Let's be a part of what God is doing. Let's be a part of what God is doing. You weren't just called to avoid problems or not make problems or not make trouble, but the Bible says you are God's masterpiece created in advance to do good works for him. You were created to do good, not just avoid evil. And that's the kind of church I want to become, right? I want to be the church where we applaud for one another instead of attack one another. I want to be the kind of church where we bless one another instead of belittle one another. I want to be the kind of church where we celebrate and cheer one another on instead of being critical and cynical about one another. A type of church that dares to do great deeds instead of discouraging one another. A type of church that we engage in the work God is doing instead of envying what one another is doing. I want to be the type of church that's a fruitful church church instead of a fruitless and fake church. I want to be the type of church where we're growing together instead of gossiping together, where we're honoring others instead of humiliating others, that we're involved in the church instead of ignoring others at church, that we're the type of church that is joyful instead of jealous, that we are kind to others instead of killing one another, the type of church that we laugh with others instead of loathing others, a church where messes are welcome instead of mumbling and murmuring, that we notice people and are nice to others others instead of neglecting others, where we're optimistic people instead of feeling overlooked by people, a church where we praise God for where we are instead of pouting about where we are, where quiet strength replaces questionable lifestyles, the type of church where we are people that we realize we have been redeemed instead of rejected, that we are strengthening one another instead of slandering one another, that we speak the truth in love instead of having toxic relationships, the type of church that's understanding and uplifting each other instead of undermining others, a church of vision and victory instead of a church that is vacant of vision, a church that is worshiping together instead of worrying alone, that we go the extra mile instead of being extra, that we're yelling for one another instead of yelling at one another, that we're zealous for the Lord instead of zoning out for what God's purpose is for us. That's the type of church foundations that we are, we're going to continue to be, and that God's calling us on to be. This is who we are. And this is why it's hard for me to sleep every stinking Saturday night. I love what God is doing in this place. And hear me, this is a we thing. We have to be amazing stewards of what he's, because what is happening in this place is not normal. It's not normal. So so here's what I want to leave you with. I'm doing good. I want you to know this. This house isn't for sale, right? This house is not for sale. Some of you are like, are we moving churches? No. The vision isn't for sale. The purpose of why we exist to make Jesus famous, it's not for sale. Like, we know what God's calling us to do. There's a lot across from my house, and uh, people come look at it all the time. Um, In fact, we had like some serious people looking at it the other day and Chloe and some of her friends ran out and act like a bunch of drunk people and we had like sparkling grape juice Um, and they're like, like this. I'm like, just go act like a fool and run them off. And they looked and they got in their cars and drove off. I'm like, way to go. Um, (laughs) We do not want them as neighbors. This is why we don't have Foundation Church bumper stickers, by the way. Um, But... Several, several years ago, uh, a person was looking at the lot and was asking me questions about it, and I was talking to him, pretty normal. And then he goes, hey, um, how much is your house for sale for? I was like, what what are you talking about? Well, would you ever sell your house? I'm like, no, my house is not for sale. He's like, so there's no price that you would sell your house for? I'm like, no. I'm like, I I don't want to sell. I love where I'm at. I love the, like, how the Lord's blessed us and where he's put us. And so so you're saying, no, I'm no. Right? And, and just as that my house wasn't for sale, can I tell you, man, the vision that God has given us as a church, it's not for sale. The vision and the value and the purpose of why we're here, it's not for sale. And I say this with all the love in my heart. Hear me, if, you're, if your spiritual gifting is sowing dissent and talking about people, hey, we welcome everybody but that. 
right? That sounds mean. It is mean. Because life's too short and we're too busy doing the things that God has called us to do to tear it down, right? So if that's you, if that's you, I'm watching you online. If that's you, there's plenty of churches that would love to have you. We're not that church. We're not that church. We're not that people. Nehemiah chapter 6 says this, Sambalt, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So Sambalt and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message to them, and I love this. It says, I am engaged in a great work, so I cannot come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? And four times they sent the same message and each time I gave the same reply. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come meet? I got too much to do to come meet with you. I am engaged in too great of a work. I'm engaged in too great of a thing for me to come down off my wall. And hear me, parents, we talked about this last week. You are engaged in too great of a calling, in too great of a thing being their parents than to get too busy, than to get distracted because don't come off your wall for something that's not near as important as your family and your kids. All the spouses here, you're engaged in, in pouring into your wife and pouring into your husband into creating a great marriage and modeling a great marriage, you are engaged in too great of a work for you to come and to get distracted and to come off your wall. For all of you singles in this place and college age students, hear me, your calling starts now. You don't need a boy and you don't need a girl to make you whole and to make you complete and to step into the calling God has for you now. Get up on your wall and understand God has great things for you to do so you don't have time to come down off your wall because you are engaged in a great work. In fact, Foundation Church, we are engaged in a great work that God is doing in this place, and we got too much going on to come down off our wall. We got too much going on to come down off our wall. I'll shut up. Here's what I would say. Here's what I'd say, and I've never told this story. Two years into our church, um, we were still meeting at Memorial High School. There was a church whose pastor left and they just built a brand new church building. And they approached me and they said, hey, would you, would you mind coming and think about and pray about being our pastor? And, and, you know, we'll just let your church merge with our church. You can bring your staff over. And I can be honest. Like, it was tempting. Because, have you been to Memorial High School? I mean, our, our nursery, our nursery was the girls' locker room, and it was gross. For, for all, the, how many of you used to go to Memorial High School with me? Like, yeah, yeah. So, so all the men know this. Like, you would walk into the stall, and there's no door on the commode. Like, you're, when we put lotion and mints there, we're like, Hi, yeah, it's nice, right? Like, there's lotion and mints. Look at the lotion and mints. Um, <laughs> don't stare at that. Stare at here. Anyways. And I got to be honest, man, it was a tempting offer, and I thought about it for about an hour. And in the moment, it was literally, the, the reality looked nothing like the vision I had, right? The, the, the reality did not look like this whatsoever. And you either are going to be bought in when it's hard, or you're not bought in at all. Right, you're either standing on that wall and you're working to do the calling and the purpose that God has called you to, or you're not gonna be invested in it at all. And the first time it's hard and the first time it's easy, you sacrifice the significance for the convenience. And hear me, Foundation Church, we're not gonna sacrifice the significance for the convenience, right? This house is not for sale. What God is doing in this place, I'm not going nowhere. Man, I'm ready to go. God would have to appear in a burning bush to me and tell me to leave. And then he would have to appear in a burning bush again to my wife and tell her, yes, it's time. He's not on a gummy right now. He is, there's something happening. We're not going anywhere. Our best is yet to come. And I get to say that with everything. We're just getting started, Foundation Church. So let's be a part of what God is doing instead of tear apart. Let's pray. Lord, I love you. Man, I, I love this church. I love what you're doing. And God, I just pray from our leadership team, myself, to this church, that this is a we thing and that we would not get in the way of what you're doing. 
but we would be great stewards of what you're doing in this place. And it's the changing and the saving of many lives on a weekly basis. So God, don't let us get in the way of that. Things may be done different that we would do different. Man, things are done different here that I would do different. Don't let us get mad. Don't let us tear it apart willingly by what we're saying. But let us be a part of what you're doing. Man, and if we can't do that, let's move on. God, I just pray that in this place, your word says that you will build your church, not Justin's church, not Foundation's church. You will build your church. This church, it's yours. You will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, Lord, don't let us become our own worst enemy. God, but let us take this message to heart. Because, Lord, a lost world's looking for people that act different and are different. They're looking for community that's different. And if we're acting like the world inside these walls, they don't want to be a part of that. They can get that out there. Let there be something different about this place. Let it be that we've heard from you Man, we're seeking you, and we are focused on building your church, your vision, your purpose, so that people can come to know you. Their life can be changed. So, God, I pray that in this place, we would be one church of one vision, of one purpose, that's staying in harmony and unity. It's in Jesus' wonderful name I pray.